from the News Channel 5 Network. This is Urban Outlook. Hello and welcome to Urban Outlook, a forum for African American issues. I'm April Eaton. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's probably no secret that the pandemic has taken a toll and had all sorts of unexpected consequences on small businesses and entrepreneurs. The National Federation of Independent Business reported this past January that U.S. small business optimism declined to an eight month low with just over half of entrepreneurs, about 55 percent confident in their business uh, operations lasting at least another year. So to talk about what the situation is, what the impact is of the pandemic on small businesses, and also to talk about some of the solutions that might be available for small business owners and entrepreneurs is Bryn Plummer. She is Vice President of Inclusion and Community Relations at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. Thank you so much for being with us, Bryn. I'm grateful to be on April. This is a topic that's super important to me. So always excited to talk with it, talk about it with other people. Uh, and talk about, let's start with that super importance. Why so much passion behind making sure that entrepreneurs have a successful venture when they decide to take one? Absolutely. So to begin, I think as a black person in America, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurialism, innovation is a part of what it means to be black. Um, I think we're familiar, you might be familiar with the phrase making a dollar out of 15 cents. I think that's what it means to be black in the U.S., you know, to make the best out of really unjust and, and complex circumstances. And entrepreneurship is no different. I think that's part of why we see entrepreneurship as this thread that runs through the black story in the United States. And in particular right now, um, where we are as uh, economic inequality goes and as wealth uh, creation goes, right now, um, black business owners are 12 are likely to have 12 to 13 times the wealth of their non-business owning black peers. So entrepreneurship can be this pathway to generational wealth creation, to taking control of one's destiny, and to shoring up a legacy, you know? And that's something that it feels like a, we're at this inflection point in society where we are finally ready to put systems and structures into place to make that entrepreneurialism um, something that's widespread, something that can also benefit our entire economy, because when we all have a role to play in growing our economic destiny, our communities thrive um, writ large. A pathway to wealth, uh, a lasting legacy, as you said, but also it takes courage to step out there and be an entrepreneur. And when you look at the year that we've had, this year full of pandemic where businesses have had to uh, do things differently, shut down in some cases, how do you get that courage to be an entrepreneur in a situation like the one that we're in? I think I think it's twofold. One, I'm overwhelmed by the courage of entrepreneurs every day. I think that cannot be overstated. I'm glad you asked that question because it takes so much courage to step away from a W-2 and uh, health benefits and just the structure of a day-to-day -day job and the security of a day-to-day -day job. Um, so it does take a tremendous amount of courage. And I think for, for entrepreneurs all have lots of different motivations. For some, it's the desire to be one's own boss and to take one's destiny in, into their own hands. I think that's a huge push as we look at motivations for why Black Americans in particular pursue entrepreneurship. And that fire is where people find the source of their courage. Sometimes it can be out of crisis, right? When there's not, um, maybe your day job is not making the ends meet the way they should. Maybe you're working a day job, maybe even a day job that has, um, a tremendously high salary, but there's still a gap between where you are and where you would be, um, what it would take to make you feel very comfortable. And so it comes out of this space of, I need to bring in extra income to solve extra problems in my life, uh, whether it's me paying a bill or, you know, a child wants to study abroad and you need to make sure that they have the money to go abroad in some cases, which is one of the entrepreneurs I work with. Part of why she started her business was she wanted to make sure her child had an amazing study abroad experience and that would only come from bringing in extra income. So um, it's a number of factors and I think um, people's motivations do vary and they vary across a lifetime. But in particular, I think the courage often comes from just seeing this is the only way to create the destiny that a person aspires to. A person might 
get to the end of where they could see their career going in an enterprise or in their field, and they've identified these huge gaps in the marketplace and they want to solve them. And the courage comes from just seeing where that uh, desire to control one's destiny and this recognition of a problem that needs to be solved come together. And how does National Entrepreneur Center help? Uh, I don't know. Is it when, uh, to get help people get started? Is to is it to to help them once they're on their way, but to give them some tips so that they continue to be successful? Where does uh, NEC fall in? I, I think we run the gamut. We really do. We think about serving the entrepreneur across the, the full life cycle of being an entrepreneur from I have an idea and I'm not sure how to turn that idea into a stood up business concept all the way through. I've grown a huge business, sold that business. Now I might be a chairperson of the board and I'm not sure what to do with my free time, but I want to give my time back to other people. We serve entrepreneurs at all phases of the life cycle of being an entrepreneur. In particular, um, when it comes to black entrepreneurs, we are very focused on this, this critical gap. We see a lot of impetus to start businesses, particularly um, businesses that might be um, germane to what someone already does well. So if someone's a great baker or um, someone, you know, is does their friends taxes because they know how to prepare taxes and things like that. And they're just going to do taxes for their friends and family. We see people trying to take their past, these skills that they've acquired over life and turn those into ways that they can monetize those skills. So it starts there. And then, and then they are like, oh, wow, I have a lot of demand to do people's taxes or I have a lot of demand to bake. And I think I could turn this into a full-fledged business idea. So we take them from that space of I have a hobby that is making me money or maybe I have a, a source of additional income into turning this into a full-fledged business. So uh, for our Black-owned businesses, we're primarily focused on businesses that currently exist and trying to grow them to some clear thresholds of business success that we see once we hit these, these couple milestones, they tend to be really good indicators of a business's ability to thrive. And the two that we tend to look at are when they hire their first employee, um, that's a really huge threshold for a business. And then when they hit their first years of six figures in revenue. So that's the window we're really focused on going from business creation, your business has started to um, you've cleared some of those milestones that make your business become, uh, you know, a stood up enterprise. You talk about some of those critical gaps that exist, and black businesses are important, period. So I'll start by saying that. But they're particularly important to a show like Urban Outlook when we have so many business owners here uh, that come on and talk about how they're making things work. But but we've also been talking for years and years about the disparities that exist when it comes to African Americans getting their businesses up and running. And, and those gaps still exist, as you say. What's happening to try to balance the scale or help us do better uh, overall in getting black businesses off and running? I, I am overwhelmed, honestly, some days by all the different interventions that are happening across the United States. Um, this is a time when I think the field of entrepreneurship and field of innovation um, is really exploring what does it mean to meaningfully support black owned businesses because it's not just focusing on individual passions it's not just focusing on individual businesses but there are clear systems in place that advantage certain business owners and disadvantage other business owners so some of the gaps that we see um, run along some we look at the systems and structures a lot um, so some of the gaps that we see are the racial wealth gap it takes a tremendous amount of capital for some businesses to get off the ground. And uh, for many entrepreneurs, they have what's called a family and friends and family round where they go to their social networks and relational networks to get the money they need to start their business. So uh, for Jeff Bezos, for example, went to his parents and asked for his parents in law, I should say, uh, and asked for a three hundred thousand uh, dollar investment in Amazon. And that was part of how he got the money off the ground to start what we now know as Amazon. And it's not uncommon for people to go to their friends and family round and ask for smaller amounts in that, of course, you know, 500, 1,000, so on and so forth. But because of the racial wealth gap, and that's the gap that exists between white Americans and black Americans or white Americans and other groups, because of that racial wealth gap that's so persistent, often black uh, Americans, we don't have as much access in our social networks to huge amounts of capital. Um, right now, I believe that the average white family has about 10 to 12 times 
the family worth and family uh, net worth of a black family in the United States. And so when you don't have as much capital in your first in that first round, that's the very beginning early stage capital, it makes it really hard. So the runway for you to start your business is shorter. Uh, there's less capital to make things happen that you need to do, whether it's buy a piece of equipment or make a lease on the property or you know, build out a whole tech platform. There's just less money to do things with. Um, so there's that. We, we really focus on the racial wealth gap and how that impacts people's experience as entrepreneurs. We're also focused on something that's known as the credit gap and the banking gap. So um, because of the family, what we see is America is like this family wealth gap. Oftentimes, Black Americans, when we have a you know a bill that's coming due and that we can't afford to pay, a lot of times there's not someone in our network that we can go to. There's not a lot of um, tools in our toolkit for how we can avoid that late payment, right? And so then we have credit issues that occur, um, and then so. Uh, credit issues are, are a huge part of making yourself credible to a bank as someone who's worthy of a loan, especially a bank loan. I mean, I'm sorry, a business loan. And uh, additionally to that, Black Americans and Latinx Americans actually tend to be underbanked. So they tend to be in banking deserts. Mm -hmm. So you could live in a place where there are, you know, tons and tons and tons of fast food restaurants or check cashing places we see many, many times over aren't a lot of banks and so you to get a business loan you need to have a, a long-term relationship with a bank usually a bank wants you to be in relationship with them for about two years um, sometimes three years and when you are less likely to be banked and less likely to have good credit um, because of these financial issues that come up when you don't have enough income you don't have enough money to pay your bills and things like that um, you're way less likely to be an attractive candidate for a bank loan. And some of the interventions we've seen across the United States in this area are, are really interesting. Like instead of determining someone's loan eligibility by their credit score or by their amount of cash on hand or cash reserves or their debt to income ratio, looking at a full holistic appraisal of this person's character. So looking at you know how much are they contributing interpersonally to the programs that they're going through? Are they likely to pursue mentorship and, and to, as they're learning, give back to other people? Are they someone who has had a track record of having a tremendous follow through in their personal networks and in their professional networks? So in particular, in the, in the Midwest, the Federal Reserve is doing a lot of interesting innovation around extending credit through uh, character appraisal and, and uh, someone's personal and professional history as opposed to their banking and credit history. Um, we're also seeing innovations around capital um, from the very early stages all the way up through someone who might be securing venture capital. So there uh, in Memphis, for example, the Epicenter Center there, which is an entrepreneur center really similar to ours and a partner of ours, they have a friends and family uh, fund that is specifically addressing the fact that most black entrepreneurs don't have a deep uh, wealth network around them. So it specifically provides uh, friend and family funding to entrepreneurs. And then they also have an opportunity fund, which is specifically targeting minority and women owned businesses that are looking for capital. So if the traditional banking landscape isn't serving entrepreneurs who are black, and if the traditional venture capital world and angel investor world isn't serving black Americans and black entrepreneurs, there are all these solutions that are being turned up that are helping entrepreneurs uh, encounter those, I guess, navigate those waters so they can get capital. And then I think the third piece that's uh, related to both the wealth gap um, and the credit and banking gap is this social and interpersonal knowledge gap. So uh, because our society is so segregated and because it's also so economically uh, segregated, there are very little, there's very little chance in our society that someone who is black would have someone in their network who has a tremendous amount of knowledge of how to grow and scale a successful business that's into seven, eight, nine figures because of how our society is set up. So one of the things that we do at the Entrepreneur Center to create more mentorship and access to these high powered networks, these high knowledge networks, is that we try to bridge mentorship and advice and guidance for entrepreneurs that are intergenerational, intereconomic, interracial, um, that really help people understand how they can contribute and what they don't know. Because a lot of times with black entrepreneurs, any entrepreneurs, they'll tell you, you don't know what you don't know. You need to talk to someone who's grown that business to, you know, a size that yeah. you, you can't even fathom yet. You have to talk to those people. So we really believe in building 
just a whole network of people that are in your corner. So when you walk through an EC program, you might have come in with 10 professional contacts in your network who can make things happen for you and you walk away with dozens and dozens of people in your corner who can show you the road. Bren, let's take a quick break and when we come back, I wanna talk more about the resources available through the Nashville Entrepreneur Center, but also talk about how consumers can play a role in all of this. You can't uh, be in business without having folks shop at your business. Uh, so we'll have more about that when we come back. Stay with us.